was involved in probably the best years of television ever in this country, and that was the five and a half years that, that uh, it ran out of Avalon. I made the first production in Sweet Eight there on February the 10th, 1975, I think, which was a pilot program for a game show called Pop the Question. I did live programs that I was doing maybe six or seven a week, seven or eight programs a week. And that was everything from music to current affairs to, you know, little dramas and all sorts of things I had complete. So we set up a production company in 1980, uh, City Associates. And the opportunity arose for me to make what I would call my first film. I had made a, I made a documentary with Robin Morrison. That was an experimental documentary using uh, new technology as an electronic field production. Um, it was one of the first documentaries that was made using electronics instead of film. But then in 1982 I got the opportunity to make what I would describe as my first film in the world population 1300, which was a, a documentary on uh, the centenary of Martinborough over in the Wairapa. Then in 1981, Judith, my partner, Judith Fife, and Hugo Manson established or did the first experimental project for New Zealand Oral History Archive which they established, and it was going to be a project on the Martinborough Centenary. But he had a particular dislike for television, um, and I understood why. He, you know, some, of the, some of the television was, was pretty, pretty seedy in terms of its approach in the 80s. And so he refused to do any, any films or anything at all for television. And um, anyway, he turned up at our place and he'd been, I'd overheard him talking to Jude about, Judith about his, his project on Fitzroy Beach. And one day I sort of had a look at some of the pictures and he told me what he was doing. And I said, oh, that's, that's interesting. I, I, I wouldn't mind making a documentary about that. And because he'd seen the Martinborough film and he thought that it had been done with a degree of sensitivity, that he felt comfortable in working with me. So we went and made a film which was called One Man and the Sea. Came along a couple of years after the beach film and said that he had this idea for a film about flying. And I, he said, I'm going to learn to fly. And I said, oh, that'll be really interesting. Stick a camera in the back of a Cessna. And he said, no, 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 without a plane. And I said, well, if you reckon you can do that, I'm sure I can make a film about it. The key to it for me was to be in at the beginning of, to me, what a true documentary is, is being in at the start and seeing the first faltering steps and the, you know, where the concept, you can see where the concept wants to go, but will it get there, you know? And that was great fun because it was cinema verite. And um, not, I don't think any, any of us on the crew had ever sort of done a, a full-blown cinema verite one where we had no idea what was going to happen the next day. After Flight of Fancy, which, which caused a wee bit of a stir, it, you know, it, it had a nice, um, had a nice, it made a nice ripple in the water, you know. Um, and it was around about the same time that Peter Jackson was harassing the film commission about getting some help to finish his first film. And I used to do some script consultancy for the film commission. Um, uh, I, they used to send me things that they wanted knifed. So Jim Booth came to see me and said, oh, look, would you have a look at this? I'll show you some of it. I said, don't tell me anything. Don't. He said, oh, there's this guy's been... I said, don't, I don't want to know. Just, I, all I want to do is see his film. That's always that thing I've had too. Is like, don't tell me anything about your film before you show it to me. Show me the film. Jim came to see me, asked me if I'd assess the film and if I thought there was any value, would I be prepared to act on behalf of the Film Commission because we felt that he was going to need some assistance externally. Um, so that was about it. And I made contact with Peter. He came in and we, one Sunday we came and sat down on a flatbed and he was, he, was, he was very good actually. I remember saying to him the same thing. Don't say anything except what's absolutely necessary. And, um, and he understood exactly that, and did exactly that, and there was a lot of mute footage. Um, and it just, oh, it just made me laugh, you know? And I think, well, I figured to myself, well, if it makes me laugh, it's gonna make somebody else laugh as well. It was after it was all over, I thought, yeah, right, you know? 
because uh, I could see the speed that things were going with Peter and, uh, and the fact that he was, he was moving fast. And I thought, well, while I can get all these people together, I'd just do this, you know, just to, just to put a little stamp in the album. So I like to understand the, the system. And so on. so, so, so the, the business of you know, getting a wrecked car out to Waikanae, a car with no wheels. How do I get a car with no wheels out to Waikanae for $30? Right. Spend thirty dollars buying the car for a start, <laughs> you know. So I got a, a wreck of a car, and then I hired a trailer. And on my own, I took it out to Caroline Girdlestone's place, where we blew the house up and um, tied a chain around a tree and the other end around the back of the car. And drove my car away and pulled the wreck of the car off the trailer. And, you know, so there were things like that that I just thought this is good fun. The thing that I uh, enjoyed work about working with Jim was that I was able to impress upon him the way that I liked to work, and he was seemed to be prepared to tolerate that. Uh, he was prepared to tolerate working with Peter, and I think he'd be prepared to tolerate working with me. And I thought that that, that will that'll 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 be fine. And I think that was my biggest loss uh, was when Jim died. Uh, to go into Jack, I felt very much on my own um, in terms of. I mean, I was working with people that I'd worked with for years, people like Jamie and, and, and Peter again. So I was, we'd never ever discussed working patterns or styles or anything else like that. And I knew what mine was um, very clearly. Um, I knew from the word go how, how I like to work. And um, I was a lost soul when it came to making Jack. The great thing about problems like that, I mean, it's a, a huge uh, series of difficulties that I faced in making that. I've got a choice, it's either cut my throat or get as far as I can with it. So I got as far as I could with it. I didn't like myself when I was doing it. Um, but it clarified so much for me afterwards. It was like my learning curve was when I, in a vertical climb. I've always had a theory, if shit's going to happen, try and get it all at once. Try and get it all on one film and boy, it all did it, it, it all turn up on Jack, that's for sure. Um, but. <laughs> But I can still look back on it and, and you know, uh, not get depressed. <laughs> it, and it, it just absolutely clarified for me that I must always, if it don't feel right, don't do it. And I'm a, quite an independent bugger, you know. I'm really good with a crew that you can get into one ten-seater van with about six empty seats. Right? That's, that's me at my best. The next project that I'm working on, I'm actually going to shoot second camera to probably one of the most challenging and demanding DOPs I know, and that's Ian Paul, who's shot the best films, that probably the most uh, elegant looking films that I've made. Um, and so he and I are going to shoot the next one <laughs> together on video, which it will be a bit of a riot. But it could look bloody interesting, you know? and, uh, uh, but in the end we're out there to capture a story, so it's onwards and upwards.